that's probably not going to be transmission. If your profit is generated because you hold yourself out to the public as being an exchanger and you profit from either the wallet, the hosted wallet service you're providing, um, or some security related functionality with the private keys, then you probably are going to be in the scope of the Money Transmitter Act. Okay, because I thought there was something like a thousand dollars per day or per transaction. Yeah, there was something to do with it. And the reason I say that is because I know there's a lot of Bitcoin um, people that will buy and sell. And I say small dollar, it could be a thousand dollars a week. Now they make money on the interchange. And I suppose technically the money transmission into But I guess the question is, is there a minimum magnitude? You know, if you do small transactions and they're just not substantial. If you're a seller of your own stock, you if you're if you are the owner of the Bitcoin and you sell it and your your gain there is simply because of the movement of the price of Bitcoin you are probably not within the scope. And I say probably because every time the model changes and it depends on the facts, right? So I can't just render an advisory opinion from here at the desk. I didn't read anything in this bill that talks about a minimum. I don't believe there's actually a minimum, but there is the, you have to be engaged in the business of transmitting currency for other people. Right, exactly. Yes, so we're gonna... You can be an individual. You could you could do this as a sole proprietor and still be within the scope of the act. So we're gonna open up the floor right now. There's a lot of questions here. So let's start. Let's go start with this woman right here. Quick question. Um, um, I have a question, uh, Catherine. Um, I'm 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 a sole proprietor right now. And someone come and I said bitcoins. You need to clarify this to me. I said bitcoins and all that stuff. And that do transmission. That means, do I need to have a license too? Again, that's going to depend on your actual circumstances. So, if you are selling your own stock of Bitcoin, you own the Bitcoin, and you are selling your Bitcoin, and you are not charging people extra above and beyond what your what the current price of Bitcoin would be, then that probably is not money transmission. If, however, you are operating some version of an exchange where you don't actually own the Bitcoin, but you are providing the service of lining up seller A with buyer B and making the exchange that way, then you may be within the transaction. No, 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 you didn't get me. But let's say I own a boutique. You know what I'm saying? I own a store boutique. People come in and I accept the coins. You know what I'm saying? I accept the coins and everything. So, speaking of the money, I want a boutique store and somebody comes in and buys, hey, I'll set the bitcoins and all that stuff, you know, that's fine with me. Do I need to have a license for that? So if you sell, let's say you sell clothes and you, or donuts, right? Yeah. There's a popular or donut coffee. store nearby that I really like. Yeah, <laughs> coffee or something. Right, and you accept bitcoin and payment for your donuts. Mm -hmm. You are a merchant, but you are not, you are not a transmitter. Okay. There's a, there's a fair probability, however, I'm just going to warn you, that there is a transmitter somewhere in that transaction. And the person who's your payment processor, just as Visa and MasterCard are today, they may be within the transmitter, the Money Transmission Act. The merchants are not. Yes. Right. Yeah. So are you, so you accept the coin for your business? And are you using a payment processor like a WebPay or Coinbase or how do you do you use a payment processor? No, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm just. Um, I don't have a book, but I'm just asking you. I'll open one today, and I just want to. No, merchants. Merchants don't apply. Right, but there might be on. I think what she's saying is somewhere in the business model. It might not be the merchant, but it might be the payment processor. They potentially could be a transmitter like a Coinbase. They're a transmitter. There's no so that question. means it's still illegal to me. No, not to the merchant. Not to the merchant. Not to the merchant. This is not, no state is. We deal with a lot of different states and on the federal level. This does not apply to merchants at all. So you're saying that the merchants and the um, the buyers or the, the the consumers. I'm sorry. So what you're saying is, is in your mind, the merchants and the consumers do not do any of the transmissions themselves. There is a middle man in there that handles right. that. So there is a another type of business model out there. It's called a payment processor. Merchants can hire a payment processor like BitPay or Coinbase to accept Bitcoin on their behalf. 
right? So they set up your wallet for you, the customer comes in, they want to pay with Bitcoin. That Bitcoin doesn't actually go to the merchant, it goes to the payment processor. And the payment processor sends the merchant either Bitcoin or dollar or a fraction of one or the other or whatever type of currency they want to get in return. That payment processor, if they are engaged in other types of activities, then they might be a transmitter. We work with a lot of payment processors, they clearly understand this issue, and it's, it's, there's been uh, quite a bit of work done to ensure that the merchant is not taking on liability, it would be the processor. Question back. Yeah, let's get, take another question back here. So, um, I've got a question, if, if you're a software developer and you make an app and you put it in the Android store and somebody uses it and you sell it for five bucks, or, you know, does that fall under the regulation? Uh, or, you know, are they, are they a transmitter? Now, if you said hosted wallets, so I guess what well, is software as a service. So if your software as a service is $10 a month to use this uh, product, which is basically a wallet, that, I mean, does that fall under the, the uh, regulation? <laughs> right, and that is where it gets tricky. So if you are a software developer and you are writing an app, uh, or let's, let's say, um, you're trying to make a, a user interface to make wallets easier when they're hosted on the user, the owner's computer, right? So there's no username and password needed to, to put one layer between the owner of the Bitcoin and their private keys, right? Then you probably are not a transmitter. But I can't sit here today and say if you design an app for, let's say, for Android or Apple, right? Um, and you put those out there and charge $5 for them, I, I, you know, I'd have to see your model to know exactly what it, what service it is you are providing. If you're selling the software and you're out at that point, I, I, I can't I can't give you a, a certain answer for that. It really does depend on the model. There's emerging a whole series of questions about do I am I in or am I out? <laughs> and you, your answers are depends on your business model. Correct. So and that's fine. Is there a resource these folks could go to that it's not the bill because all of what you talked about is not in the bill, but you, you've got a lot of interpretation of it already. Is there a resource we can go to or Q&A? So the commissioner's office has a website, um, it's www.nccob.gov. On our website we have a virtual currency corner. Um, as part of that virtual currency corner, we have posted there administrative rules. Um, we are trying to pull together some guidance related to some of these issues that will hopefully put some of these things to rest. Um, and then further to that, if the bill were to pass either this session or next session, um, there will be some additional clarification there as well. I, I, I hate having to say it depends on your model. And unfortunately, that is where we are today because this, the, this, uh, the blockchain technology moves so quickly and developers are so creative in terms of the way that they structure their applications, the way that the wallets are being handled, um, and frankly, the, the opportunity that exists for different models to function and fork off of each other. Okay, so. But what I can assure you is that merchants, for example, there are broad categories, broad swaths of the virtual currency ecosystem that are not within the Transmitter Act. So we have other panelists up here. Does anybody have any other questions? We'll, we'll, we'll go ahead. Actually, I'm going to answer your question that you asked earlier about where they're going to go. And I'm going to ask you how we're going to handle this is they're going to go out of the country. Transmitters, processors, they're going to leave this country. This is a global economy. And these companies are going to go out of the country and they're going to take our money with them. Just like they took our jobs with them over the years. I've been in this industry for 32 years. Telecom and data come and I've watched it grow and I've watched it fall. So to answer your question, they'll take it with them to other countries. And how are you going to control that? I would say that is very true. We are seeing brain drain. Uh, we work with companies all over the world. Um, and a big issue that we're seeing in the United States is we do not have one fully regulated exchange in the U.S. 
So 70 or 47 states regulate money transmission. So that means if you are in exchange in the virtual currency space, you have to go to all of those states and get a license or an exemption. Uh, not one company has made it through that process. That's a big problem because Americans do not have a regulated place to buy and sell Bitcoin. So where are they going? Mount Gox. You guys remember that company? Uh, there's another company, Bitstamp. They had a big hack. It was pretty public. It was very damaging to the industry's rep uh, reputation. It is in everyone's best interest that we get the regulatory structure right in the United States because Americans today do not have a place to buy and sell Bitcoin in a safe way. And they are being forced to go overseas where they don't have the same standards, the same ethics, they're not regulated in the same way. And we're seeing all sorts of huge scandals when the you know, Mount Box is probably the Enron of today, uh, digital currency space, um, and, and it is an issue. So it is in our best interest to get this right. Um, and I, you know, and it's, I deal with companies on a daily basis who are going through the state process, and uh, you know, they'll send it, they'll send an application to like Katie's office, and then the the regulator it now has this new thing on their desk that says Bitcoin, and they're like, what the heck is Bitcoin? And they've been required by law to oversee this. I mean, it's not her fault someone needs a license from her office. They need guidance to figure out how to get it through. It's in the industry's best interest to figure out a regulatory structure that works, that small businesses and startups can get through, and that are able to get licensed in a timely manner. Because today we don't have one company that's been able to figure out how to get through that. Chris, your thoughts on this? Well, they are. That is that is happening. It absolutely. I mean, we're we're seeing brain drain. I will tell you uh, about a billion dollars. That this industry, the digital currency industry, is on track for a billion dollars in venture capital investment. This is uh, every major bank is looking at blockchain technology. Every major tech company is looking at this. They're publicly admitting it too. We've come a long way in the past year. Uh, all the money is coming from the United States, so I am very optimistic that the U.S. will continue to be a leader here, but until we get this money transmission piece right, we're missing a pretty integral piece for the ecosystem to work. Okay, let's keep it to the mic for Chris. You have some thoughts on that? To uh, answer your question, that they're leaving, yes, they're, uh, they're leaving, so I would say this, and I'm going to give an example. Why don't we draft legislation in North Carolina that's friendly to keeping the folks here? One aspect would be lowering the price of the net worth of doing business. Let me give you a quick example, folks. Uh, I had a drone contract, and the um, Federal Aviation Agency says when you fly airplanes, you fly at a minimum altitude of 500 feet in rural areas. So basically from 500 feet on down is no man's land. It was unregulated. Now here come drones and they're flying around. What do you do? Well, you can't have drone or pilot licenses for 50 states. So eventually the Federal Aviation Agency will draft legislation for drones in the process of doing that. What the state of North Carolina did as an interim, and I helped with that, we drafted rules and laws that pertain to North Carolina with the companies in mind. So we have one or two right now, maybe more possibly, uh, manufacturers of drones in North Carolina, not only does that help the state with one company, but soon RTP is going to be, and hopefully RTP will be the new Silicon Valley for drones. So to answer your question, let's don't let them go out of the country, let's keep them here. And how do we do that? We do that by having friendly legislation to keep them here. And it can be done, it's not that difficult. Thank you, Chris. I did have another question. So I, I have to, I'm going to change it. I think it's a little bit different. I think North Carolina, I guess, why did North Carolina choose nationally to be first? Because I think that's, and I say first meaning what New York did, I think, um, was, you know, 
had all sorts of seizures. But so North Carolina is leading the nation. Uh, and I guess what brought it to North Carolina's attention before 49 or you know other states? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, that's pretty forward thinking in terms of legislation. Um, thank you. I think. <laughs> um, no, I mean, because we've seen judicial, you know, 14 states had judicial review indicating that it was not money for the purpose of money transmission, but they have not addressed it legislatively except for California and New York. So North Carolina is, again, I think nationally, I mean, what made them take it out? I think that, you know, that's... Uh, and to be frank with you, applications, um, we have a 120-day time limit within our statute. After we've received an application, we have to make a decision. Um, so within 120 days, we have to either deny an applicant their license or it's automatically granted. So that's what kicked off this conversation in the commissioner's office. Um, but frankly, we, we feel like of the 50 states, we've struck a, an excellent balance in terms of fostering innovation and protecting the consumer. Um, because when you handle other people's money, you do, the, the banking commissioner believes that you do have an obligation to do that with a, a degree of responsibility that is at these levels. So have you gotten feedback from other, um, you know, other states, banking commissioners, I mean, we, feedback? We have. Um, we, we communicate with all the other, with a lot of the other states regularly. Um, we, we, our approach, we believe, um, is less burdensome than a lot of the other states. Um, we specifically chose not to go in the direction of a bit license framework, for example, because we felt that that would have stifled innovation a significant amount. Um, likewise, with a $10 million capital requirement imposed on trust companies, that would also be stifling. Um, so while we, we communicate with our fellow states, uh, we, we hope to set sort of a pace. Yeah, I had some questions regarding the capital uh, requirements. Um, first of all, do you know if crypto-based assets could be counted towards the capital uh, requirement? Not for the net worth, but in SB 680, for example, um, there is a, a, a statutory permission to allow virtual currency to serve as your permissible investment backing. So all money transmitters are required to maintain permissible investments in an amount sufficient to cover outstanding transmissions. Um, under the current law, virtual currency is not an option. Under SB 680, uh, in response to industry feedback, we incorporated a virtual currency permissible investment allowance as well. Gotcha. Yeah, I think uh, one of the sort of disappointing things about the legislation is that I feel like there's actually a lot of opportunity for us to make use of features of these new cryptocurrencies and other assets. And uh, I bring this up specifically because uh, my company has uh, brought forth uh, something that's called cryptographic proof of reserves, whereby you can instantaneously, without uh, disclosing the uh, private keys or the specific addresses, prove that you have a specific amount of cryptocurrency or other assets. So I think like actually taking advantage of some of these features of the system uh, could be helpful for companies. Um, and also, um, I'm also interested because this would affect uh, my employer, um, how does all of the, this money transmission regulation, it sounds like it could potentially affect uh, wallet providers who are uh, custodial providers and actually managing private keys. Uh, my employer, however, we operate a multi-signature wallet and we are in a non-custodial position where we only have one out of three keys to unlock uh, a, a wallet. So, do you see this affecting non-custodial providers? Do you think maybe something in the future could be uh, trying to cover non-custodial providers? It's, a, it's an interesting question um, and I, I also hope you have an excellent patent lawyer as well because it sounds like a very um, the the, uh, the proof of reserve idea, of course. Um, in terms of the uh, non-custodial wallet provider, the model that you've described, um, if if it's the case that your company is the linchpin in the user's ability to access their virtual currency, then you are probably within the, in the act. 
If that's not the case, however, and the user still retains complete control and it really is non-custodial, um, the user continues, the owner continues to have absolute control over it and there's no risk of loss by your company, um, then you may be outside the scope of the act. We're somewhere in the middle. Of course you are. <laughs> Isn't everyone? <laughs> Brad, okay. anybody else has a comment on that question, Eric? I can hear you want to test it. The multi-sig industry is definitely has some challenges when it comes to how policy is going to affect these business models. Um, and I, th I think what Jameson is, is trying to get across is that his company, at the end of the day, cannot access the Bitcoin. They have customers, they're holding the Bitcoin for their customer. In no way, shape, or form can they access that Bitcoin. They're, hold, they're paid to hold it and to store it and to safe keep it, but they don't. At the end of the day, they don't have all the keys. So there's no there's no way the CEO can siphon Bitcoin out of the bottom of the wallet. You can kind of think of us as, as a signatory service. Uh, we sign off if conditions are met uh, and, and create a transaction, but we cannot by ourselves create the transaction. Right. So, and I think the issue there that you're that you're talking about, it sounds almost like you provide escrow services of some form, right? Some escrow providers are within the Transmitter Act, and I hate to tell you that, <laughs> but, but if you are in the position that you are the last word on whether a transfer can take place or not, then you have that, you, you need to meet those bare minimum responsibility requirements. Yeah, so the reason that I said we're in the middle is because uh, the user still has another two keys, so they do have the ability to take funds out without asking for our permission. So we offer sort of both of those models simultaneously. So if you want the greatest degree of comfort, we invite you to submit a letter to our office, and we will tell you uh, whether you were within the scope or not, and what the questions are that you need that we need more information about. Um, we do take those questions. <coughs> anonymously, um, but we will ask a series of detailed questions if we have them, um, if we are not clear on what your model is, and we do try to respond in writing to those requests. Um, I, I, I can't tell you what applications we are looking at currently, um, neither can I tell you which are uh, so I have two questions, one uh, really general and one a little more specific. Uh, the general one, um, so when there were talks of FinCEN, I know FinCEN put out some advisory guidance, like FAQs essentially, um, and that was really helpful I think in providing some clarity and I was wondering if North Carolina is planning on doing anything like that on the website um, or <laughs> Is there, uh, is there an opportunity for this type of dialogue to continue and for people to get feedback? Yes. Uh -oh. They turned off my mic. There is an opportunity for continued feedback um, here. And we do, we have convened a series of stakeholder groups, particularly as we were going through the legislation, but also as we were looking at doing this through the rulemaking process. So we do invite people to please give us your views. Um, we hold meetings throughout the year that you can attend, frankly, similar to this one, to tell us how you feel about what our proposals are. Second question, a more specific one. Uh, so I'm holding a copy of the uh, SB 680 or HB 289 here. Uh, and I was really curious, um, there's this exemption section here. Uh, I'm not trying to hack this, but I'm really uh, curious what the intent was. Um, this section A8, where essentially if there's an agreement between a payee and an agent, and like the payee holds out the agent saying, like, we have an agreement here, uh, then that could be uh, grounds for exemption. And I'm thinking, well, blockchain technology kind of does that inherently. If you were to sign a message, post it as proof, um, it would be very easy for somebody to make an argument that an entire business model could fall under an exempt category. So I was wondering if there was a specific model you were thinking or an example 
Uh, we were not thinking of the blockchain model that you just described. Um, that is a, a, a phenomenon that occurs in traditional transmission frequently, um, where, uh, say, just for example, the power company agrees to allow 7-Eleven to accept payments. 7-Eleven becomes a, a payment processor at that point on behalf of the power company. Um, but we felt that it wasn't from a, a consumer protection standpoint, it made very little sense to require the payment the, the 7-Eleven to meet the minimum standards there if the power company agreed that at the moment the consumer delivered their funds to 7-Eleven that the bill was paid and that the power company had no further right to seek payment from the consumer at that point. So that was a, a regulatory compromise, if you will, based on the actual risk to the consumers. Anybody else? Good to stand up and ask. Okay. Um, I, I got a quick, you know, if I mean, the Bitcoin community is pretty good at encryption, I guess it's obvious, right? So, you know, if you, if you pass these rules and, you know, they just kind of decide to circumvent the rules, I mean, how, what kind of resources will it take to, you know, go after the guys that are just, you know, Everything's encrypted. I mean, is there going to be the SBI chasing that stuff down? Or, I mean, is it going to be? I mean, how, how much would that cost? I mean, what kind of resources would you have to throw to even to even try to enforce that regulation? I guess. I mean, obviously, you get the people that are out in the open, you know, but uh, you know, if they go offline. What, what are you going to do then? <laughs> not well, offline, if they, but they, if go, they go offline. Not you, offline, but you know, <laughs> I mean, it's not that hard to you know shell into a, a server that's in you know on the other side of the world just continue operations. I mean, how, right. how are you going to stop? I think if you Google the, the FinCEN enforcement action against Ripple Labs, you'll get your answer there. Um, there are resources available, particularly as adoption grows with virtual currency. Um, I can't speak for the SBI or the U.S. Attorney's Office or the uh, 100 county DAs as to how much resources they would throw at this issue. Um, but I can assure you that if if user adoption continues and consumers in North Carolina are harmed, you will ultimately see a task force of some sort convened in this state. Any more specific questions than that? Todd? Oh, I, you know, we could, yeah, we could go all night. I was just going to say, Erica, from your perspective, I know I wanted to get some in there because I was going to say, what are you seeing nationally and, and, and pertains to North Carolina? What are you hearing from other states? about the North Carolina bill, or have you heard, are, are they giving you any feedback? Um, I would just say, I mean, North Carolina really, they're just, they're the first to go. I mean, California is still working through their bill, but North Carolina surely has us as long as part of I think other states are looking at, um, should they create study groups? I know Vermont, the Vermont governor recently announced that he was going to start a, a study group to look look at um, digital currency before they move to legislation. Um, and I know that the state has spent some time doing that as, as well. Um, I mean, I think overall, um, you're seeing a lot of um, a lot of states, especially who have um, members of the legislature that are view themselves as being innovators that want to focus on this issue. And I believe that the most important thing is to have stakeholder involvement early um, and to make sure that you're engaged with what's happening in terms of as the legislation written or as the regs are written, um, leading on great um, trade associations that carry in, it has to really make sure that the community is involved in the process. I mean, and making sure you're educating legislators. I mean, that's what we always, I always emphasize to my clients, um, since I work, I work in the public affairs and government relations area, is that it's so important to develop the relationships early and often and not wait to the 11th hour to say, this isn't a bill that we like and we want X changes to it. So, I think other states are trying to um, involve stakeholders early 